Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome again. I think we're in our fourth week already. I can't believe how fast this is going by. And I uh, hope you're finding the class meaningful and enjoying it, because I am. Uh, the first thing I wanted to start with, well, let's look at the, um, <clears throat> this week we're going to do bond valuation. And we're also going to introduce equity valuation. And I gave you this channel in the past. This is my um, YouTube channel. And I can't stress enough how um, I want you to, Utilize it. So when you go to playlist, I have Accounting Academy, Finance Academy, Economics Academy, and Statistics Academy. Some of them are concentric, meaning that you know you might see the same video in both. But Economics is basically Economics, and Accounting will give you this. Accounting, I really, I gave you guys the interactive spreadsheet, and I think it's this is one of the most helpful things I've found. And I spent a lot of time creating it, and it goes through. There's five parts to it, and it goes through the entire set of financial statements. So we're going to go through balance sheet, income statement, um, cash flow fund statement. Uh, so you really, we really give it a thorough coverage of everything that would go into a statement. So I'm hoping that you utilize this thing because it's, uh, it'll be a great help to you. Um, so it's really important. I can't stress that enough. Um, now, in terms of what we're going to learn today and which is the bond market. Well, again, if you go to my finance academy, you're going to see that I have equity value models. And I, I by the way, I gave you links to these in, in the announcements. Uh, time value of money using Excel, nature of bond valuation, how the Fed controls interest rates, which is not exactly modeling, but it shows you where interest rates, how they emanate and where they're coming from. <clears throat> Tutorials on how to find a corporate bond yield. Uh, ratio analysis, which helps you again with, with financial statements. I mean, there is a wealth of stuff here. <clears throat> so what I'm hoping is capital asset pricing model, which we covered last week. I cannot stress this enough. The Gordon growth disc dividend discount model, which you'll be covering when you do equity valuation. How we calculate beta, how we use regressions. You can get that in the Statistics Academy. Weighted average cost of capital. A little fun one is why LeBron James is grossly undervalued. It's really a time value of money question. Um, so there's a lot of stuff here. I urge you in the most um, strong terms to, and you guys have been great, you know, let me start with that, is to make um, make yourself available, you know, make, make this available to yourself. Statistics Academy would help because this is a modeling class. A lot of, again, is concentric, how to calculate beta. I mean, you don't need all of it, <clears throat> but it's here. It's here, and it could definitely be a help to you. Okay, it could definitely be a help especially in a class like this where we're modeling, all right? So um, please, please, please utilize it. It will help you. And, and it won't just help you vis-a-vis -vis the grades, which are important, no question. We know how important grades are. But it will help you on this further understand what you're trying to do here and, and really, um, you know, nail down what, what, we, what we're teaching here, which is... Uh, which is the um, modeling. Okay. Just give me a minute. I, gotta, I have a little, there's a little bar up here. So when, sometimes you have to wait for the bar to go up. So just bear with me. All right. So then this week, I'm going to go to that's our class. That's our, that's our meeting. Um, I'm going to go through our objectives. We're going to talk about bond pricing in a minute. I traded bonds my entire career. There's some nifty, um, there's some nifty, um, Equations. Another thing I would suggest is to get a good bond calculator, depending. You're going to make a career in this. I'm holding one up. This is a very good one. It's the BA2 plus. You know, you read the directions. It's a lot like Excel. Of course, this class, I have to admit, Rasmussen, Rasmussen does a great job of giving you uh, the, the guidance on Excel. It's really, I'm very impressed. But these are other ways to do it. There's the HBO 12C, which I used on Wall Street for 30 years. You know, and it gives you bond calculations right up here. You know, you know, right up here, you can see that there's a place to plug in present value, future value. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do it right now, but um, you can find a million YouTubes on how to use the HP12C because it really is one of the standards in finance. So that's one I would highly recommend. And not just for bonds, but, you know, these are the same way you would calculate interest rate, um, like mortgages. And then there's the BA2+, plus, which is also terrific. These are really good calculators. This is real good stuff. 
Okay. Um, you want to go through all of this bootstrapping. Equity analysis, again, I want you to go back. I want you to go back and look at my Gordon Grid discount model and my video on equity value. That's been one of my most popular videos because I take you through all the equity value processes. So please go back and do that. Um, what else? Oh, another thing I think that Rasmussen does that's just lights out, really good stuff, is the transferable skills introduction. So I would spend some time, you know, with this because if you if you're not already familiar, what Rasmussen is trying to do is show you how to get transferable skills, which is just the, the one of the best. I wholly endorse one of the reasons why I wanted to work here, and I'm glad that I do. What's nice about it is you can take these skills out to the real world. Very important that you do that. So you've got critical thinking, which is improving thinking, problem solving, all stuff you need in the business world. Digital fluency, information literacy. I'm going to come back to that in a little while. So I don't want to, I know we have a time limit here. I want to make sure I cover our work, but I want you to spend some time with this. Very important that you do. And today's um, keyword, your password is going to be, we'll use baseball. I'm following the World Series, having a lot of fun with it. I'm a huge baseball fan. I actually played basketball and soccer as a kid. But I love baseball. It's my favorite. I'm a Mets fan. But I love baseball, so I love watching the World Series. To me, it's such a, and you know, I've never missed one. So, really enjoying the series. It's actually a pretty good series. LA and Tampa Bay, they're going at it. It's interesting now, right? Because the Lakers won in basketball. Tampa Bay won in hockey. Tampa Bay actually has a shot. And the Los Angeles teams may have a shot at the Super Bowl. Tampa Bay certainly could. They got Brady. But you may have, like, a... Out of nowhere, Tampa Bay, well, Tampa Bay's behind now, so momentum was with Los Angeles, but very interesting year for sports, right? Needless to say. All right, so let's just do a little work. So uh, how do we, what do we do with bonds? What is a bond? What is a bond? A bond is nothing, and this is from your notes. This you can call up from your, um, you know, this you call up. It's investment banking for dummies. It's in the course show. School provides it. A bond is a tradable loan. A bond is a tradable loan. So you, it's, you are loaning money to a company, you're loaning money to a corporation, or you could be loaning money to the government, the U.S. government, the, the municipal government, your town, your county, your state. You're giving them money. But so we homogenize this loan. We homogenize this loan. What does that mean? We, you can't make a separate loan agreement. It would take forever and it would be uneconomical. So the bond market basically has <clears throat> certain terms. The same way like when you buy milk. You buy it by the gallon. You buy it by the quart. When you buy gas, you buy it by the gallon. Imagine if you went in and just said, well, just give me so much gas. Or give me this much bread. It would not work. It would work, but it would be such so much more <clears throat> inefficient. By making everything homogenized, it's easier to trade. You're giving units of trade. So a bond has certain basic terms. Most bonds trade in $1,000 denominations, right? Most bonds have a coupon rate of interest. So it's a $1,000 bond. If it's, Say it's at 5%. The bond would pay fifty dollars. That's not a bond. Five percent, fifty dollars, and and all bond traders know that. The bond is governed by an indenture, so the indenture is essentially the contract between the bond issuer or the lender and the bondholder, the people who buy these bonds. And you can buy a billion dollars worth of bonds, but you buy them one thousand dollar lots. So you buy a billion dollars of one thousand dollar bonds. Every bond is a thousand dollars. That's the unit of trading. Like when you buy gasoline. You buy it in gallons. You, you know, you don't say, give me half a gallon. I guess you could, but they sell it to you and they quote the price in gallons. You can't buy half a bond. You have to buy a $1,000 bond. But again, if you bought a million dollars worth of bonds, you'd buy a million $1,000 pieces, right? So that's called, the, the price of the bond is called par. It's at hundred. We quote bonds in terms of par, which is $100 per 1,000 units. But we really mean, when we say, a bond is trading at 99, for instance, it's 99% of a thousand dollars. So we quote the bond on 99%, which is 990. And that allows us to use time value of money to see what the yield to maturity is and how long the bond's life is, effective life. So know that every bond has a coupon rate of interest and we have a bond indenture, which is a contract. Now, the contract is mostly like a lease contract when you buy a car or a, um, 
a contract when you buy a house, a mortgage contract, they all start to look the same. They all start looking like boilerplate, but there are differences in certain bonds. And there's some of them have these covenants. <clears throat> bonds have covenants. And what are these covenants? What's a covenant? Go back to the Bible, right? It's a, it's a promise. And the promise is, I'm, I'm, like, for instance, when Coca-Cola borrows money, they make a covenant with their lenders that we're going to make Coca-Cola with this money. We're not going to turn it into a biotech firm. We're not going to turn it into a real estate investment trust. We're going to turn it into what we into. Um, we're going to make Coca-Cola with it because you you you're lending money based on a business that they're involved, in, not on a business they want to get involved in. You have nothing that you don't know about. They're also going to sometimes make. A restrictive covenants like we won't borrow x amount of dollars or we won't merge in a certain way and if they do those things they have to give you give you the option to have your money back so um and that kind of says it right there. and so does the denomination part um and this is exactly what i said it's divided into smaller chunks this is really good this this i, I this is a very good easy way to understand the bond market so this, i love this chapter um, unlike stocks, the bondholder has no interest. It's a fixed income. You're a lender. Remember, there's only two ways we can finance a company. It's either by selling stock or issuing bonds. It's either taking in partners, selling stock, issuing bonds, borrowing money. Borrowing money leverages our investment. Borrowing money is a way where we, we can leverage our investment. Because remember, if I'm the sole owner and I borrow money, well, I have to pay the interest, right? But I leverage my investment. Right, so I can make more money on my money. Right, if let's say I'm the only partner and I own 100% of the company, and 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 the company is worth a million dollars, I and I need another million dollars. I can do two things: I can sell stock, in which case now I'm a 50% owner and I got to split the profits 50/50. But I have a partner who shares in the losses with me, or I can go out and borrow a million dollars, which means now I have to pay the interest on that million dollars. And I also have to make good on that million dollars at the end and have to give them my money back. That's negative because now I have to pay that off before I get paid. Positive is if the earnings go up, I share in 100% and I double my money and I can make more money because I have more capital. Think about it like when you buy a house. If I go out and I'm looking at a $500,000 house, right? And I put 100% of the money down, 500,000, and the house goes up in value by $100,000, my return is 100 over 500, which is 20%, right? Fine, we all understand that. But if I go out and put down 100, conventional, and I take a $400,000 mortgage, well, I got to pay the interest on the mortgage, and I got to pay the mortgage every month. But if the, the house goes up in value by the same 100,000, now I've made 100% of my investment, but I have debt. So try to think of using debt that way. The one thing you want to know about corporate debt is its tax advantage, which means the government will allow you to deduct the interest on the debt. And that makes the debt very um, attractive to most people. The fact that you can deduct the interest from your taxes in a corporation gives debt an advantage. And there's a lot of academic study on that. But the long story short is it's called a tax shield. And you see that when we do weighted average cost of capital. So it really is an interesting way to... Um, multiply, you know, to, 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 to use that, get the tax advantage, multiply your earnings. And, and, and this is a great point. Leverage is a double-edged sword. And what does that mean? You know, leverage could work for you. So you're going back to my house example, house goes up $100,000, you've made doubled your money. But if the house goes down $100,000, you've lost all your equity. So as opposed to the guy who put $500,000 on the house, who only lose 20% of his equity or equity. So be aware of leverage. Leverage is good when the markets go up, but it hurts a lot more on the way on the way down because of the nature of leverage. So the leverage is clearly a double-edged sword. And that's a famous quote that we use when we talk about leverage in the bond market. So it's really important you understand that. And that's what happened in 2008. We loaned money to, 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 to we loaned money to um, real estate on real estate and with the idea that real estate always goes up in value. The mistake was, and we talked about this last week when we talked about value at risk, the mistake was they used full D data. They didn't realize that with the system changing, if you recall, watch my video from last week, if you recall, that that creates an issue. That really creates an issue. Because um, what it does is it 
it, it, we're, we're borrowing, um, we're over leveraging with data, with, with, with the comfort that, that houses will go up in value. Um, so that's why corporations issue guns. No pain, no gain applies to the investment banking world as much as the gym. Investors take on risk for gain. And so you're taking on these risks for gain. And the way we measure risks, as we talked last week, is standard deviation. So for various asset classes, when we look at what's risky, we notice that, and this make, should make sense to you now. Ah, this should make sense to you by now. That higher returns equal, or measure it with higher standard deviations of return. Again, go back to my, we have limited time here, so go back to my video from last week and watch it. But we should expect that the, the, something that's risky, like small stocks, and small stocks would make sense, right? Small companies are going to be riskier than big companies. are going to have higher rates of return, but bigger deviations of return, more variation, more risk. Because it's not because, <clears throat> think about the concept. A small company is going to be more sensitive to economic shocks. So it's going to be a riskier company. So when things are good, they're probably going to do a lot better. But when the economy is bad, <clears throat> they're going to have bigger rates. The deviation of their returns are going to vary even. Large stocks are going to have less deviation because they're more buffeted by, um, like they go better the large ship as opposed to a small ship. You know, boat ships can go down in a bad storm, God forbid, but the smaller ship is going to be more suspect or more um, you know, threatened by a storm because it's small as opposed to, say, a cruise ship. <clears throat> which has a lot more weight and ballast. Same thing with companies. A big company like Coca-Cola is going to be able to weather an economic downturn. doesn't mean it can never go out of business. Any company can go out of business, but <clears throat> it'll have the advantage of being such a big company. Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> I'm sorry about that. We're, it's an allergy season here. Whereas small stocks have much more variation. Notice that with the bond market, you're going to have much less return and less variation because these are the loans and we expect them to just get paid. And the source is Ibbotson, which is a great source I should just mention. If you're doing your own research, Ibbotson, um, Ibbotson puts out some great statistics on uh, market results for stock bonds. So if you're doing any kind of um, research, I should point that out. I just noticed that as I went through it. <clears throat> there are different kinds of bonds, convertible bonds, which believe it or not, was my specialty. I traded them for many years. Those are bonds which you can convert into equity. But those are bonds which you can turn into the equity of the company. And it's got an advantage. Why would, people, why would companies do that? But let's say a company has to pay 10% in interest. And instead, would like to have a lower rate of interest. Well, that company could pay, say, 6 or 7% or 5%, which is a lower rate of interest. But they're giving the holder of the bond the opportunity to participate in the stock above a certain level. So, for instance, let's say a company's stock is trading at $100. And it's a growth company that has a lot of up and down. <clears throat> and the company would have to pay 8% interest, but would like to pay 4% interest. The investment bankers might design a deal where the company only pays 4%. You only get 4% as the lender. But if the, comp the stock goes above 100, say, now the stock's with 100, usually 20% above would be 120, right? If the stock goes above 120, you can turn that $1,000 bond into $120 worth of stock. So 1,000 divided by 120 would be like eight shares or eight and a half shares. You would get eight and a half shares of stock. And if the stock keeps going up, your bond would be convertible into higher values of shares and it would trade up. So if the stock all of a sudden, so let's do the math <clears throat> on a convertible. If this, then you can follow me at home. Let's get, a, let's get an Excel spreadsheet up. You can follow me at home by watching. So I, I, I put out this convertible. It's a $1,000 convertible. Give me a minute while it comes up. Um, $1,000 convertible. Okay. Let's just close this. Okay. Close this. So I sell this $1,000 convertible. I get a better rate. But I'm going to convert it. The stock's at 100 and if it goes above 120, 20% above, you can participate. So what does that mean? I can turn this $1,000 bond, I divide by 120, into 8.3%. What happens if tomorrow the stock trades at 400? 
happy days. Well, now this bond will be worth like an option. Uh, sorry. It would be worth 400 times 8.333. 3,333. And in bonds, we would quote it as 333. What happens if the bond trades to 20? That's bad news, right? That's bad news. <clears throat> now the bond would have an intrinsic value or a stock value of only 166, which would be a disaster. You paid a thousand, it's only worth 166,000. Except for the fact that it still pays a 4% coupon. Now the normal that's now the normal rate of interest for this bond would have been eight percent. Right? We started with they had to pay eight or ten percent. So at one point, if the bond keeps trading down, the four percent over a certain number is gonna is gonna equal if the bond trades down, like say the bond trades down to five hundred dollars a share, five hundred dollars a bond. Well, you know with four percent you're earning a forty dollar coupon, right? Forty four percent times a thousand. And if I just do a simple math calculation, divide the 500, divide the 40 by 500, I'm still getting the $40 payout. I'm going to be earning 8%. <clears throat> As this starts hitting 40 or 400, the bond should stop losing money because bond investors who don't care about the stock will buy it. That's kind of a quick example of convertibles, but it gives you an example how you have a little protection on the downside, you still lose money. But on the upside, you participate. So we call that a hybrid instrument because it participates on the upside and the down, and it kind of it, it it slows down the downside risk. Some bonds are called, and so if you if you're interested, it's a specialty item. It's a fascinating item. Convertibles are part bond, part option. Callable bonds are bonds that the company can call at any time. So what does that mean? The company has the right to refinance, like you could refinance your mortgage. Now, when they refinance, so you may have a 10-year bond that pays 5%, and let's suppose that in year three, the rate the company could pay has gone down, and they would rather get a new rate, sell new bonds to the investors. They can buy back your bonds, but they have to pay you a premium. So they might have to give you an extra 102, 1,020, 1,030 instead of 1,000. So callable bonds will give you a little bit of a premium. We call it in, in the bond market a kiss, but... Um, but we also will get refinanced. So that will also kind of weigh a little more negatively on the bond because it's like you made a loan, but you're not guaranteed to keep that, get that money back for 10 years if it's going well. And the rates go down, the, like a mortgage, the company can call it back and refinance at better rates. Puttable bonds are better for the holder. Puttable bonds give the holder, the lender, a right to give the bonds back to someone, almost like a car lease, right? Think about a car lease. A car lease has a put. Right? You auto, you take an auto lease and you know in three years you can either buy the car or give it back to the company within certain stipulations. So it's a put. You can put it back to the company. Well, puttable bonds will allow the holder, if let's say it's a 10-year bond, but in year five the holder doesn't like what they see with the company, the economy's bad or the company isn't doing as well, they can sell the bonds back and the company has to buy it. Obviously, the problem there is if the company's going out of business, you can have an issue with the put. But it's also a very interesting other version of Floating rate bonds <clears throat> don't have fixed interest payments. Remember, I use this example of an 8% coupon, right? I use this example of an 8% coupon, but a floating rate bond doesn't have this, this steady coupon. It has a floating rate, like a floating rate mortgage. Again, the mortgage really helps us here understand that if you have a mortgage or if you're going to take a mortgage. So it's based on certain treasury rates, usually the prime rate of interest. And you can get all those rates, and I gave you this. I really want you guys to make yourself avail, you know, make start studying the financial press. But the Wall Street Journal, and it's a cheap, and really for fifty dollars a year for a student, it's such a great investment. And you get the online access. You can get a lot of this stuff by just clicking on markets. And let's see, and going to the bond market. Give me a minute. And going to the bond market. <clears throat> That's S and P stocks. And I like to get you. Okay, so you go there. You go to bonds and rates, and that's going to lead you into bonds and rates. That's why I really urge you to. You have, if you, if you're going to model, you have to understand the markets. 
I can't stress it enough. So there's the 30 year where the US government borrows, there's the 10 year, there's the yield curve, which we talked about last week. There's different rates, and then there's the consumer rate. So the Fed funds is here, the prime rate is three and a quarter percent, which is really where most banks start. So when they give out mortgages or floating rates, they base it on the prime rate of interest, which is where banks lend to one another. New car loan, you get four percent. It's a really good time to borrow money. And the reason why it's a good time to borrow money is that the government, you know, the Fed, they want to keep rates slow so you'll invest. So you'll take your money out of investments and you'll put it into um, cars, houses, businesses. Zero coupon bonds don't pay any interest. I don't like them personally. I think I, I, I don't know if I said it to this list or not because I do not like zero coupon bonds. I feel that you shouldn't lend money out for zero percent. However, if the government does it, they may give you a little bit of a better rate, and they're not really a credit risk. I worry about corporations because they could be a credit risk. However, I don't worry about it with um, with with the government. And so, what some people do is put them in tax advantage, like a four hundred one k, because they pay a little better interest, and you'll get your money in the end. The problem with a zero, and I mentioned this, is the government will charge you whatever you were going to earn in interest that year. They'll charge you for that. You'll pay interest. You'll pay taxes on interest you didn't receive. In the end, you'll get your payout. But you'll buy the bond at a lot smaller. Like you'll buy a four, you'll buy a thousand dollar bond for four or five hundred, and the implied value will be ten percent. So, for instance, let's take a look. You use a, uh, and you're going to be doing this hopefully. You use a, uh, a rate. You solve for rate. Solve for rate. So, what? How do we solve for rate? We'll say, well, it's a ten year bond. I'm going to do by annual. There's no payment. It's a zero. I'm paying five hundred dollars. I'm getting a thousand at the end. It's a seven percent yield. So again, five hundred over a thousand means that in the end, when I get that thousand dollars in ten years, I earn seven percent. If I pay less, obviously I'm going to get a buy higher rate. If I pay only four hundred, I'm going to get a ten percent yield. If I pay six hundred, government charges you each year on interest that you would have gotten. And that's what I. That's how a zero works. Um, you're positioned as a bondholder. In a merger, you could get hurt. In a merger, you could get hurt because the company you merged with might have a worse credit than you have. There are covenants to protect you. So you want to know that. Here's the long story short about investing in bonds. So, you know, so, so for instance, Coca-Cola, remember, you, 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 I don't know how far back you guys go. There are covenants to protect you. But I remember that, you know, AOL at one point, AOL had the largest, um, they had the largest, the best internet search engine, right? It was AOL. And then Google came along and kind of knocked them out of the box. And that became a real problem for AOL. And we understand that. However, um, the AOL holders got crushed. Time Warner, oh, I, I know. I, there was Time Warner acquired AOL and it really hurt Time Warner stock. And at the time, Time Warner was a much stronger company. You have covenants to protect you against that. So generally speaking, you were allowed to sell the bonds back, but that all comes when you read the covenant. Now, it's hard for an individual investor, unless you're incredibly wealthy and you have a team of people watching, to make these loans and watch every investment. Generally speaking, the best way to invest in the bond market is to buy a mutual fund, where the mutual fund buys many bonds and the analysts look at many bonds. It's almost like being a landlord. Everybody talks about being a landlord. But what you got to remember is there's a lot of ways you can get hurt as being a landlord. If I have one house and I'm only renting to one family, or one person and they default and right now people are defaulting well i don't collect any interest i don't collect any rent but i'm still responsible for the cost of the property and that could really hurt you know even if it came by legitimately and they just can't pay me and now during covid you can't necessarily evict anybody which is not a bad thing because it protects people who are really in trouble but there are stories about people who are taking advantage of it but that's me that as it may you're really getting hurt as a, as a landlord but if but that's why to be a landlord or a bondholder you want to own many you want to own many different kinds of bonds. And as a landlord, it's not easy, right? How am I going to buy all this property? As a bondholder, how am I going to buy all these bonds? I mean, I only have so much money in the bank. But you can buy um, all kinds of mutual funds that have many bonds and give you a slice. Or you can buy a real estate investment trust that has many units and gives you a piece. And this way, if one or two people default, you're protected by diversification. Almost like, almost like, when you have, um, almost like when you have um, an insurance company, 
an insurance company, they don't just insure one person, they insure many people. So they blend their risks over many people. And that's how an insurance company works. We did present value and present value calculations. We've already gone through this, allow you to value a bond. So we can find the present value of a bond by looking at the discounted value of all the payments in a bond. Okay, and you should go over this in this week. And definitely, this is if you watch my LeBron James video, you're gonna. This is what I address: that these big coupon, that these big contracts, when you look at them on a present value basis, are not worth what the company, what, what people think they're worth. So let's look at a, con, a, a contract for a baseball player that makes a hundred million dollars. We we'll use a hundred over ten years. So every year the player gets ten million dollars. Okay, a lot of money, a lot of money. The first thing you got to realize is they're in a very high tax bracket, very high tax bracket. Okay? And also, ball players and, and entertainers have to pay extra taxes in every state they earn money in. So every time the ball player goes to a different city, he pays them a tax. So that tax rate could be up to 55%. So right off the bat, the $10 million, which seems like the, all the money in the world, and it is a lot of money, has to be multiplied by 0.45 to get to the actual money that the person has, which is four and a half million. And of that four hundred fifty million, <clears throat> they pay twenty percent to their rate. So that number has to be reduced to twenty <clears> percent. <throat> so that's the actual money the player sees. Uh oh. Let me write that. I'm sorry. That is point two. So that money actually has to be twenty percent. It's not. Let's just start again. Hundred and four and a half million times 0.8, that money has to be uh I could, yeah, sorry. It shows you have to be careful with this thing, right? It becomes 3.6 million. Now let's do the present value calculation like you believe. Let's go to there. Let's go to present value. And let's say we discount back by 7%, which is going to put the percent sign. Always remember that. And it's a 10-year contract. And the payment every year is going to be now 3.6. million dollar contract. That's why it pays to be the owner and not the player. It's only worth $25 million from day one. And he actually, they go through this. And you could work out the numbers on your own. When we look at the present value of all the cash flows plus the final payment, we get the yield. We get the price of the bond, and we get the yield to maturity. Thank you. I'm a little oatmeal. This is $40 on a five-year bond. So it's 40, and at the end of the 50, you get a dollar. $40 on a five-year bond, we use present value. Now what's the rate? Um, 6%. Okay, so I'm gonna discount them back by 6%. Here's payments of 40, future value zero. That's the value of the coupons, or the coupons you get. Now you get your money back at a thousand, but you're not getting back for five years. So present value of that's 6%. Number of periods is five. Payments, so we already counted for the payments of the coupon. Future value is a thousand. That's the value of the that's the value of the bond. I want to make these into positive. I want to make that into a positive. Add it up. Bond and the principal piece. Add some. And I'm doing this so you can get comfortable with Excel. I love Excel. You could do these on those kind of bond calculators. Like 1575. Voila, there's your number. There you 
equal 16849. A thousand equals, and so that's your principal piece, it'll be worth 747 in five years. Your coupons will be worth 168. If I get a 4% bond that's discounted at 6%, the value of my bond is 957. Do the number at home, do the work at home. Once again, the, the, um, the code word is baseball. What determines the shield? Why do, how do we come up with 6%? What do other similar bonds trade at? Right? It's like a credit rating. The more risky the bond the company becomes, the higher rate they have to pay, and that's going to give you a bigger discount. Remember, the, rate, the discount rate is going to be related to the risk, standard deviation of returns, the risk of the company. The more risky the company, the higher the discount. The less risky, the lower the discount. And we generally have spreads over treasuries, which means, as I went over, we saw these are the treasury rates, and all bonds are quoted as a spread over them. So, for instance, right now, the 10-year corporate bond trades at 0.625, and that's why you really got to study these numbers. As a finance professional, you should know these numbers cold. So it's 0.625 your bond is going to be based on that. So if you have a very safe bond like Coca-Cola, they might only, that company might only pay like 1%, which is 37 and a half basis points over there. 0.375 above the 10 year, for 10 year money. A very risky company might pay five or 6%, which is almost five or 6% above the 10 year note. Because right now the bond market the rates are very low. The government is keeping the rates low. The Federal Reserve is keeping rates low because they want to keep the economy going. Okay, they want to keep that economy going. They want, if they make rates low, you're going to want to invest your money instead of keeping it in the bank. And that gets the economy going. You study economics, and hopefully I'll teach economics here. I teach economics at other classes, you multiply, your money multiplies. Okay. All bonds are sensitive to generally market rates, but more the lower the coupon, the higher the sensitivity. The longer the bond, the higher the sensitivity. That should make sense. You're getting a low payout or you're lending the money out for longer periods. You're going to be more sensitive to interest rates. The higher the coupon, the lower the maturity, the less sensitivity. If I'm getting my money back in a year, I'm going to be less sensitive to interest rates mathematically. If I'm lending money out for 30 years, I'm going to be more sensitive. And you can work those numbers out. And finally, duration is a measure of how long the bond actually lasts. So it's a very complicated... Um, it's a very complicated um, calculation. It's the weighted average of all your payments. It's the weighted average of all your payments. So if you notice that this particular bond, let's see if I can explain this. This particular bond has these different cash flows. And then based on the discount rate, we look at the present value. And then we find the weighted average of the present values and we get the Duration and in this case is 7.9 years. So a 10-year bond is actually has a life of 7.9 years because you're getting money ahead of time. And what duration tells us is based on the fact that you're getting this money ahead of time, that's with the life of the bond. So it's it's interesting. Now, do you have to do calculation duration by hand? Well, if you go for your doctorate in finance, they may ask you to do that. For the most part, the Bloomberg is going to have those numbers. I think I went over that. The Bloomberg will have those numbers. Or the or the or, or the um, a lot of systems will have those numbers. Bloomberg bond page. So if you get access to a Bloomberg one day, and it's great, utilize it. But the Bloomberg bond page will have those numbers. Yes, and that's really one of the one of the strengths of having a Bloomberg is they made their money or they made their name based on understanding the bond market. I go back to the 1980s when they started, you're going to get these pages on Bloomberg and then they're going to give you different bonds and you'll pick. They have ways of finding the bond. I don't need to get into that. But once you get the bond, it's going to give you all the information on the bond. It's going to give you the, the, the tracking numbers. It's going to give you the life of the bond. It's even going to give you the indenture. And then it's going to give you a page where you can plug in numbers and find the risk, and, the, and which is basically a function of duration. So for more advanced classes or more modeling. So what I'm really trying to say is if you're really to model, you don't have to work out these numbers on your own. Like you don't have to work out the Black-Scholes numbers. 
but this gives you a lot of information. Bloomberg is terrific. It's really how they made their name. And um, I think that gets us there. You know, track the bond market. I already showed you. You could track it, the yield curve on the Wall Street Journal. And how, when whether, does a company use debt or equity? Let's stop sharing the screen. Does a bond use debt or equity? Well, that's a function of uh, how they want to arrange their capital. The right mix of debt, debt and equity, the right mix of debt and equity is going to be the most efficient way for a company. Finances, right? It's just like you. You go buy a house. How much money should I put down on that? It's not for most people, obviously. you got to get that down payment. But let's say... You're a person who saved their money and now you've got a nice million dollars in the bank. God bless you. And you look at a five hundred thousand dollar house. You know, you can say, Well, I'll I'll put down a hundred, I'll keep the other four hundred in a mortgage, and I'll keep the rest of the money in investments. Well, if those investments are doing better than what you're paying in the mortgage, you're really efficient at that point. And if the investments are safe, you're really efficient because you only might be paying three or four percent of the mortgage and maybe earning nine, eight, nine percent of your investments. So on that extra money, that nine hundred, on that four hundred thousand, you're earning basically four or five percent because you're borrowing it for, and then not counting taxes, you're earning say eight or nine. You're very efficient in terms of how you did it. But if you're not earning the money in an outside investment, you may want to um, put more money down on the house and leave that alone because you're doing just as well with you know that's your best investment is the house because the house will tend to go up in value and you'll and and, you want, and you'll be in a safer position. It's the same thing with a company. Depending on your outlook for your company, you have to arrange your debt. And the way you arrange it might, you know, you might, if you feel the company has a lot of growth prospects, you may want to take on more debt. And of course, the bondholders are taking the risk of that. Because in academics, we, we kind of realize that bonds are an option on equity. Because when I put those bonds on, I'm actually getting more leverage for my equity, but the bondholders take the first losses at the stock. Market. If, I can't, if I can't pay... My debt holders, I go out of business, but the bondholders share it. Um, so generally speaking, we have like something called the signaling theory, where when companies sell equity, they're basically signaling that they're worried about their future because they want to take in partners. And when, and when, and when companies sell bonds, they're more aggressive about their future because they'd rather borrow and leverage their investment. That's called signaling theory. So that wraps it up for this week. Um, as always, it's always a pleasure working with you guys. Please go to my YouTube channel, and I look forward to seeing you next week.